Welcome everybody. We're so excited to see everyone today. I'm Sharice with the Howard County Library System. We are recording this class. You are free to turn on your camera and interact with our wonderful presenter from Hoko Palitzo, Susan Hobby. But we do ask that during the actual poetry moments that you keep your audio off because sometimes you don't realize um, if there is some noise in the background. Also, we do have closed captioning that you can toggle on and off. And please be aware that this is automated closed captioning, so there might be errors. Um, it is automated by Zoom. We're using the meeting format to encourage interaction and questions. All four episodes will be posted on our YouTube channel. This is our second session. And after the event, we'll send out a survey and would love to hear from you. The follow-up email will also have a list of additional poetry books for you to explore. That link was also in the calendar entry that you saw on the library site. If you scroll through the chat, you will see that I've posted quite a bit of information about upcoming classes and also um, a survey because we'd love to hear from you, as I mentioned, and also um, some additional information, including the fact that if you have any questions or comments, please do post them in the chat. A couple of ticklers real quick. We have an apprenticeship class coming up on the 14th to earn while you learn. And we do have a uh, writing workshop on May 5th and the links are in the chat for that. So let's go ahead and kick this off. I'm so excited to introduce Susan Hobby. Um, she may be familiar to many of you from Poco Polizzo. Um, for 15 years, she has worked as a special projects coordinator for Hoko Pulitzer, the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society. She has also served on the Society's board for more than 20 years. She's a founding member of the Little Patuxent Review and interviews nationally known authors for that literary magazine. Susan is also a freelance writer and editor, and she writes her own fiction and poetry. So. Join me in welcoming Susan Hobby, and I turn it over to you, Susan. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Susan. I, I noticed that there's a, a little note in the chat that says that there's nothing in chat. So Kathy, if you might, you might want to um, resubmit all of the things that you were putting in chat, because I don't see any, and I, I think Kathy says that there's, there's nothing that she can see either. So, um, so that little housekeeping out of the way. Um, hi, I see some folks here that were here last week. Thanks again for joining me. I didn't, didn't scare you off. Um, so uh, we had some great suggestions on um, process, how we're running the program last week. I really appreciate all of those. So we're gonna do it a little differently this week. Um, uh, we're gonna run the poetry moments um, I'm going to do a quick intro to each of them and run the poetry moments and then we'll have a discussion. So, but if you have things that you think about, or if you want to say, dump them in the chat and we'll, we'll grab all those thoughts and, and talk about them. So thanks so much for coming back. Thanks for joining us. If you're new, um, I'm very excited to talk about the um, poems this week. Um, it, you know, we're all poetry friends here. Let's just be, um, be friendly and 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 chat. So I gave some quotes last year, last week about poetry. Here, you know, about what poetry is. So here's my submission this week for for what is poetry. So the poet, there's a poet named Marianne Moore whom I love. Um, she was uh, early in, in the 19th century, or 18th, 20th century, excuse me. Um, she wrote a poem. It was called just poetry, and it begins, "I too dislike it. There are things that are important beyond this all this fiddle." Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers there is in it, after all, a place for the genuine. And so a place for the genuine is a great way to think about poetry, but it's only my second favorite way she defines poetry in this poem. Uh, later in the same poem, she describes poetry as imaginary gardens with real toads in them. And that's my, one of my favorite ways of describing poetry. Um, it's something to be experienced. 
Um, not something that you have to dissect every word, although you can do that if that's your jam. Um, absolutely. Po poets, I think, really love when people really get into their words. But um, when I used to teach Shakespeare, I used to explain that his plays, which were just poems recited by different characters, they weren't meant to be read, but they were being shouted over people, you know, heckling and drinking and eating. Um, so you can just let these words wash over you. You don't have to worry about obsessing over each little meaning, but you certainly can later if you'd like to. So um, I wanted to alert you uh, to a couple things um, about these week's poems. Um, sound is something we should really be paying attention to in this week's collection of poems, um, because particularly the first two poets are playing with dialect and um, two words that I love, mellifluence and cacophony. So mellifluence is, mellifluence is like really beautiful sounds and cacophony of course is really scary sounds. Um, so the theme this week is history. So poems have been used to tell history since we were gathered around the fire with a stick of meat over the flame, you know, um, traveling poets used, well, they were really reciters. They used rhyme and rhythm to help them remember huge long stretches of epic poems and repeat them to different communities before there was actual written language. Um, the very first poems were, were really probably just songs. So the Iliad and the Odyssey, which were Greek, and the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is Mesopotamian, and the Legend of Liango, which is in Swahili. They're, they're these epic adventure and hero quest poems that were shared orally first and then written down. So many historical poems were lost. Poems um, can tell stories about events um, from long ago or from yesterday. I mean, that's so sorry, we're having a couple of folks jumping in. We're very happy to welcome everybody. Um, so I've pulled together um, three really different history themed poems for this week's discussion. And most history poems, like most poetry, is just trying to capture a moment and convey it. Um, so our first poem this week, first poetry moment is um, by Sterling Allen Brown. And it's a poem called Southern Road. And it's not read by Sterling Allen Brown because by the time we were taping these um, poetry moments, um, he was dead. Um, but we, it's read by a poet named Toy Darakot that we had, uh, that Hoko Polizzo had. Um, and Southern Road, it was first published in 1932 and it's all about repetition because um, it's all about the sound and it's almost a song. Um, so Sterling Allen Brown, he actually spent summers in Howard County because his family had a farm down near Savage. Um, but he was a scholar. He was a history and writing professor at Howard University in DC. Um, and one of his big um, study focuses, he studied the songs and stories of rural black Southerners. Um, many of his poems are an attempt to capture this kind of folklore and song that was quickly being lost as Southern black people migrated to the North to escape Jim Crow. Um, so Brown believed that this kind of folklore and song was passed along in generations of Black Americans as a kind of teaching method, really, um, uh, kind of lessons on how you survive in a hostile environment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and play our first poetry moment. And um, I'm going to use a, um, a technique that one of us, one of the um, participants last week suggested, which is I'm gonna play the poetry moment and then I'm gonna go back and play just the poem again so folks can hear it because sometimes they go by so quickly you can't catch them. So um, I'm gonna try that and if that works, then um, uh, you let me know and we'll, uh, we'll try that with the others. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's Poetry Moment. I'm Sean Sebastian Nahr. Author Toy Derricka was asked to choose a poem that changed her life. 
she immediately picked Southern Road by Sterling Allen Brown. Brown wrote Southern Road to convey the chain gang speech and song in a way that American readers had never seen before. Poet Derricka explained that besides Langston Hughes, she had read no works by black writers in grade school, in high school, or even in college. When she started reading Brown's poems, she said they blew my mind. With colloquial rhymes and dialect, the poem's rhythms echoes the call and response of chain gang songs, as well as Southern blues music. Chain gangs were conceived during the Civil War to provide free labor and proliferated in the South until the 1950s. In some states like Georgia and North Carolina, chain gangs lingered until the 1970s. Incarcerated people, many of whom were Black and most of whom were convicted of minor crimes, were shackled together at the ankles to provide free labor for states. They broke rocks, built the nation's roads and highways, dug ditches. Prisoners were sometimes kept in cages, always worked mercilessly usually fed little and beaten liberally. Brown studied Southern culture, including chain gangs, folk music, and the lives of farm laborers. He was not only a poet, but a folklorist and professor. He wrote essays about Southern Black culture for the Federal Writers Project and for academic journals. Brown, whose father was born into slavery and became a prominent minister and professor at Howard University, taught for more than 40 years at Howard. Sterling Allen Brown became a bridge between the Harlem Renaissance and contemporary Black poets like Derrick A 2019 finalist for the National Book Award for Poetry, Derrick visited Hoko Polizzo in 2012 to read her own poetry. She also filmed an interview about her work with poet and activist E. Ethelbert Miller. Miller asked her to read some poetry that inspired her. Derrick Hott chose a Sylvia Plath poem and Southern Road by Sterling Brown. With her inspired reading of the last three stanzas, Derrick Hott conveys the poem's rhythm of pain and defiance. And now, Toy Derrick Hott reads Southern Road by Sterling Brown. Double shackled, huh, guard behind. Double shackled, huh, guard behind. Ball and chain, baby, on my mind. White man tells me, huh, damn your soul. White man tells me, huh, damn your soul. Got no need, baby, to be told. Chain gang never, huh, let me go. Chain man never, let me go. Whole lost boy, baby, evermore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so should we let's let's hear that again because it was quick. Going right back to there. All right. Double shackled, huh? Guard behind. Double shackled, huh? Guard behind. Ball and chain, baby, on my mind. White man tells me, huh? Damn your soul. White man tells me, huh? Damn your soul. Got no need, baby, to be told. Chain gang never, huh, let me go. Chain man never, let me go. Whole lost boy, baby, evermore. All right. So you can hear the kind of um, uh, colloquial rhymes, right? So, um, instead of the the rhyme of soul well this the rhyme of soul is rhymed with told but you don't hear the d sound because it's it's colloquial um so i thought i thought you did a great job reading it um so the the poem is actually based on the songs of real chain gangs um and these groups of pit prisoners were really customary sites to see along roadsides and, and digging ditches in the South. Um, and they sung these very rhythmic songs, um, very much related to the songs that many of their ancestors sang while working plantations as slave people, enslaved people. Um, so the songs kind of kept the rock breakers or ditch diggers in a rhythm. 
we can hear that rhythm in that poem. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you next about um, another, uh, our next poem, which is called In the Tradition by Amiri Baraka. The, we don't have the whole poem because it is a long poem. It's almost a book length poem. It was published in 1980. Um, and he was, uh, the poet Baraka was born in New Jersey um, as Leroy Jones, and he attended Rutgers and Howard University, and then he went into the Air Force, and then he went back to Columbia University. So he's really well educated, and you can hear all of the education coming through in this poem. Um, he was friends with the beat poets like Allen Ginsberg, um, and he was later a black nationalist. He was founders, one of the founders of the black arts movement. And his work was really meant to shock and awaken audiences to the social injustices around them. He was surrounded by controversy all his life because he spoke very freely about his thoughts. And some of those thoughts were not very politically correct, but he never stopped speaking up. Um, and the poem is, he speaks really fast and it's really a performance poem because he almost sings part of this poem. It's, it's a great recitation. And he was pretty old when he came to see us and, and recite this poem or read this poem for us. He was probably 70 and then he died probably 15 years later. Um, so, uh, so we were lucky to, to get this recitation. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, play the next one. And um, then I'll ask a quick question. Actually, what did you guys think? Um, give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, should I play the poems again? Um, repeat them. I'm seeing a nod from Bonnie and Eileen. Perfect. Okay. So this one's going to be a little longer, So, but he speaks really fast. So it's going to go by really quick. And uh, Anne says, yes, please. Okay. Fabulous. All right. So I'll remember to go back and play the poem again after the introduction and the initial reading of the poem. We don't have audio, Susan. We don't have audio. But that, I was hoping I could mute myself without re muting the computer. Yeah. That clearly doesn't work. All right, so sorry. If I, if you, if I sniffle, please, <laughs> please don't worry. Cause I have a little bit of allergies. I was trying to mute my sniffling. <laughs> so let me try that again. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's Poetry Moment, featuring Amiri Baraka's poem, In the Tradition. I'm Sean Sebastian Nock. The poet Amiri Baraka did not mince words. He wrote words, he played with words, he even sang words, but mince, never. One of the founders of the black arts movement, Baraka was known as a fiery speaker, a firm believer in the primacy of black music and culture in American poetry and a tireless advocate for free speech. Here is an excerpt from Home one of a series of essays published in 1996. The black artist's role in America is to aid in the destruction of America as he notes it. His role is to report and reflect so precisely the nature of the society and of himself in that society that other men will be moved by the exactness of his rendering. And if they are black men, grow strong through this movement having seen their own strength and weakness. And if they are white men, tremble, curse, and go mad because they will be drenched with the filth of their evil. Words were weapons 
or Barak. And he was going to wield them as fiercely as he could. In this poetry moment, Baraka reads and croons a portion of his epic history poem in the tradition in which he names black people who added to American life. Shadjoyner Truth, Langston Hughes, W.E.B. Du Bois, H. Rap Brown, The Only Is Monk, and many other musicians, thinkers, and artists. After Baraka died, the New Yorker's Jelani Cobb wrote, his poetic voice with its ebonics, conjugations, and sly rhythms was that of the man on the Newark Boulevard or the Harlem Avenue. If black people can exert a valid claim on American democracy, Baraka seemed to be saying, then there's no reason for their language not to have an equally powerful standing in American literature. Baraka achieved that powerful standing in literature. And to get there, he never minced words. And now, In the Tradition by Amiri Baraka. Arthur Blythe says it, In the Tradition. Tradition of Douglas, of David Walker, Garnett, Turner, Tubman, of rages, yeah, rages, of kings and counts and dukes, of satchel mouths and sunrods, of Bessies and Billies and sassies and Mars, musical screaming niggas, yeah. Tradition of Brown Wells and Brown Sterling and Brown Clifford, of H. Rap and H. Box, Black Baltimore, Sister Blues, anti-slavery singers, countless funky blind folks and one leg country beboppers, bottle neck and guitar neck dudes, whispering, thrashing, cakewalking, raging, ladies and gent, get down folks, elegant as sky riding, tradition of Du Bois, Baby Dodds and Lovey Austin, Sojourner, I thought I heard Buddy Bolden say, you terrible, you awful, Lester, why do you want to be the president of all this, of the blues and slow sideways horn, tradition of blue presidents locked up in the brig for wearing zoot suit army pants, tradition of monks and outside dudes, of Mary Lou's and notes hung vibrating blue just beyond, just after, just before, just faster, just slowly twilight crazier than Europe or its racist children. Be do dee 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 Arthur, tradition of shooters and silver fast dribblers, a real fancy mammy jam as fancy as birds flight, sunward, high, 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 sunward, arc swoop spirals in the tradition. Quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, thirty seconds, sixty fourth, hundred twenty eighth silver blue presidents of Langston and Langston manifestos. Tell us again about the Negro artists in the racial mountains, so we will not be Negro artists, McKay banjos and Holmes in Harlem, blue black boys and little Richard Wright's tradition of for my people, Margaret Walker and David Walker and Junior Walker and Walker Smith, sweet Ray Leonard rocking in rhythm with musical dukes. What is this tradition based on? We blue black wards struggling against a big white fog. Africa people, our fingerprints are everywhere on you, America. Our fingerprints are everywhere. Césaire told you that. Our family strewn around the world has made more parts of that world blue and funky, cooler, flashy, hotter, Afro-Cuban, James Brownie, a wide pan-African world. Though we are Afro-Americans, African-Americans, let the geographic history of our flaming hatchet motion, hot axe motion, hammer and hatchet, our cotton history, our rum and indigo, sugarcane history. In the tradition. Woo! I don't think I could talk that fast. <laughs> Do we want to hear it again? Yeah? Okay. He does a great job uh, getting it Arthur all in. Arthur Blythe says it in the tradition. Tradition of Douglas, of David Walker, Garnett, Turner, Tubman, of rages, yeah, rages, of kings and counts and dukes of satchel mouths and sunrods of Bessies and Billies and sassies and Mars, musical screaming niggas, yeah. Tradition of Brown Wells and Brown Sterling and Brown Clifford of H. Rap and H. Box, Black Baltimore, Sister Blues, anti-slavery singers, countless funky blind folks and one leg country beboppers, bottle neck and guitar deck dudes, whispering, thrashing, cakewalking, raging, ladies and gent, get down folks, elegant as sky riding, Tradition of Du Bois, 
Baby Dodds and Lovey Austin, Sojourner. I thought I heard Buddy Bolden say, you terrible, you awful. Lester, why do you want to be the president of all this? Of the blues and slow sideways horn. Tradition of blue presidents locked up in the brig for wearing zoot suit army pants. Tradition of monks and outside dudes, of Mary Lou's and notes hung vibrating blue just beyond, just after, just before, just faster, just slowly twilight crazier than Europe or its racist children. Be do dee 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 Arthur. Tradition of shooters and silver fast dribblers, a real fancy mammy jam as fancy as birds flight, sunward, high, 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 sunward arc swoop spirals in the tradition. Quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, thirty seconds, sixty fourth, one hundred twenty eighth, silver blue presidents of Langston and Langston manifestos. Tell us again about the Negro artists in the racial mountains, so we will not be Negro artists. McKay banjos and Holmes in Harlem, blue black boys and Little Richard Wright's tradition of for my people Margaret Walker and David Walker and Junior Walker and Walker Smith, sweet Ray Leonard, rocking in rhythm with musical dukes. What is this tradition based on? We blue black wards struggling against a big white fog. Africa people, our fingerprints are everywhere on you, America. Our fingerprints are everywhere. Césaire told you that. Our family strewn around the world has made more parts of that world blue and funky, cooler, flashier, hotter, Afro-Cuban, James Brownie, a wide pan-African world. Though we are Afro-Americans, African-Americans, let the geographic history of our flaming hatchet motion, hot axe motion, hammer and hatchet, our cotton history, our rum and indigo, sugarcane history. Whew. That was a whole avalanche of words and history. I feel like I need footnotes for that one. Um, that was, it, it was written in a kind of stream of consciousness. I think of um, the way Faulkner wrote a lot of his um, fiction linking musicians and writers and artists together in this kind of celebration of culture. And he, in the, later in the poem, he said that this was an unending everywhere at the same timeline. Um, he was a real scholar of black music and history and poetry. And he wrote tons of books about the blues and plays. And he wrote essays and 10 books of poetry. Um, one of my one of the lines that hit me in this poem is our fingerprints are everywhere on you America oh and I see Anne has that same line um, pulled out um, it's just I mean he names all these musicians I don't know if you caught some of the um, the musicians names and the um, you know Sugar Ray Leonard and Satchel Paige and um, all of the writers and H. Rap Brown and politicians and activists he just like strings it all together, but the sound is so interesting, how he pulls all that together and, and makes those sounds really sing to us. Um, okay, and I'm gonna talk about our last poetry moment because we're running out of time. We have only 15 minutes left. Um, so the last poem is written by Anna Akhmatova. She's a Russian poet and it's called Requiem, but this is read by a poet named Carolyn Forche. Um, so Requiem is an, it's an elegy. So it's, it's kind of a, a really long, sad story. Um, it was written by Anna Akhmata, Akhmatova, sorry, my Russian, um, about the suffering of people under the great purge. So it was written in, it was written over three decades. It took her three decades to write between 1935 and 1961. Um, and she carried this poem with her, redrafting it as she worked and lived in towns and cities across Russia and um, because of government repression, the poem wasn't published until 1963 in the West and then not until 1987 in Russia. Um, so in this long poem, she writes, um, 100 million voices shout through her tortured mouth. So it's about suffering, um, specifically hers and other families who were oppressed and tortured and executed during the Great Terror. Um, so Stalin perpetrated these horrors on his own people from, 1946, uh, from 1938 to 1946. And they, they estimate that the number of people killed was about a million. Um, and so in the 1980s, a poet named Carolyn Forche um, read this poem and she coined a term 
for a particular kind of history poem. It, she called it poetry of witness. And she kind of categorized it as poetry by people who have survived war and torture or enslavement, imprisonment. Um, she read this poem, Requiem, and it inspired her to collect this kind of poetry. And for the next 20 years, she, she did collect this poetry. And in 1993, she published the book called Against Forgetting 20th Century Poetry of Witness. And I'll, I'll put that name in the, um, uh, in the chat. Um, and it brings together 140 poets from across five continents. Um, and she said that Requiem was one of the poems that really made her want to write this or collect this book. So I'm gonna start the last poetry moment and then we'll chat. Welcome to Hoko Politzo's Poetry Moment, featuring Requiem by Anna Akmaktova. I'm Sean Sebastian Nall. Akmaktova was a Russian poet and translator who barely survived the atrocities of her country. She lived through the Great Purge and the Stalinist terror, more than 15 years of her books being banned and suppressed, grinding poverty, harassments, and threats from the state police. She conceived of her poem, Requiem, while standing in line with hundreds of other women outside Leningrad's prison. Akmaktova and the other women were waiting with baskets of food they hoped to smuggle into the prison for their family members. One day, while standing in the cold in line, another woman heard that Akmaktova was a poet and asked her to get out the news about their vigil. Akmaktova began writing. Subject to constant danger of search and arrest, Akmaktova composed Requiem on scraps of paper, told her long narrative poem line by line to her closest friends to memorize, then burned the bits of paper in an ashtray. She was afraid for good reason. A repression order by the Soviet government was signed in 1937, condemning those speaking against the government. The order instructed insurrectionists in category one to be executed by shooting, while those placed in category two were sent to gulag, forced labor camps. Akmaktova's anguishing family story is told in her poem. Akmaktova's son was dragged from home in the middle of the night by state police because his mother and father, both subversive poets, spoke against the government. His father died in prison. Akmaktova waited outside the Leningrad prison for the 17 months her son was in prison there and then fretted at home when he was sent to a forced labor camp. For decades, she wrote in secret and hoped to see again her son who after 20 years was eventually released. Akmaktova chose not to immigrate. Instead, staying in the Soviet Union to act as a witness to the horrors around her. Because of its criticism of the purges, her poem, Requiem, was not published in the USSR until 1987. Soon after it was published in America, poet Carolyn Forche read Akmaktova's poem. Known for her own poems about Civil War atrocities in El Salvador, Forche spent 13 years collecting work from the world's poets like Akmaktova, writers who had endured imprisonment, exile, repression, censorship, war. In her book, Against Forgetting, 20th Century Poetry of Witness, Forche amassed poems from more than 140 writers from five continents, spanning history from the Armenian genocide to the massacre in Tiananmen Square. She coined the term poetry of witness, naming the method writers use to describe history under extreme conditions. Forche explained, I was interested in what these experiences had done to the poet's imaginations and to their language, and whether or not, regardless of the subject matter, whether one could feel this suffering and extremity in the poems. The lines Forche reads in this poetry moment 
are only a small excerpt of Akhmatova's longer work. The Antioch Review wrote that the poems for Shea Collective provide irrefutable and copious evidence of the human ability to record, to write, to speak in the face of those atrocities. For Shea said her anthology takes its impulse from the words of Roberto Brecht poem. He wrote, in the dark times, will there be singing? Yes, there will be singing about the dark times, especially in dark times, poets must sing. And now, Requiem by Anna Akhmaktova. Requiem. No foreign sky protected me. No stranger's wing shielded my face. I stand as witness to the common lot survivor of that time, that place, instead of a preface. In the terrible years of the Yashov terror, I spent 17 months waiting in line outside the prison in Leningrad. One day, somebody in the crowd identified me. Standing behind me was a woman with lips blue from the cold who had, of course, never heard me called by name before. Now she started out of the torpor common to us all and asked me in a whisper, everyone whispered there, can you describe this? And I said, I can. Then something like a smile passed fleetingly over what had once been her face. So that was really short. We'll go back and listen to the, just that little preface. Requiem. No foreign sky protected me. No stranger's wing shielded my face. I stand as witness to the common lot, survivor of that time, that place, instead of a preface. In the terrible years of the Yashov terror, I spent 17 months waiting in line outside the prison in Leningrad. One day, somebody in the crowd identified me. Standing behind me was a woman with lips blue from the cold who had, of course, never heard me called by name before. Now she started out of the torpor common to us all and asked me in a whisper, everyone whispered there, can you describe this? And I said, I can. Then something like a smile passed fleetingly over what had once been her face. All right, Whew. that was a tough one. Um, so that was just the, the very short introduction to the epic poem, but it gives you the kind of reason for the poet writing the poem, you know, a window into a capturing a slice of history that, that might not have been told if Akhmatova had not written it. Um, so, now is our chance. Um, we had a lot of history thrown at us today, a lot of, um, a lot of suffering, but a lot of uh, joy as well and interest. Um, anybody uh, respond to a particular poem? Anyone can go ahead and unmute themselves if they want to participate in the conversation or put a note in the chat. Thanks, Reese. Thank you. This is wonderful. I was I was really compelled by the steps that sh that uh, the last poet had to take. That she, you know, told her friends and had to memorize it, and then had to destroy the the writing. I mean that that's really dedication on her part, and also her friends and relatives, whoever was doing that, to preserve that. Right. I mean, this poem is probably about 30 pages long. So imagine, yeah, writing on little bits of paper and then burning them in the ashtray because the state police were constantly barging in, into Akhmatova's apartment and looking for any evidence they could possibly find to throw her in jail. Um, yeah, crazy that that kind of 
history, you think about that was captured just by sheer determination and how much history has been lost um, because not everybody has Akhmatova's dedication. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, really good point. Um, I like find it so interesting, the, the poems that have rhythm to them. Mm -hmm. When different people read them, you get a different sense of the musicality of the language. Yeah. And, uh, I, that, I, I'm sure you've experienced that when you've heard different people read, read poems for, for Hoko Polizzo. Right, it really, when I was, I was trying to teach a, a poet named Seamus Haney, he's an Irish poet. I was trying to teach his poem called Digging and the students did not get the rhymes until I played it in his voice mm -hmm. because he has this, you know, it's an Irish accent. So he says, gravelly ground. And people didn't understand, you know, they didn't get the rhyme until he said ground. They're like, oh, that rhyme, you know. And so I agree, hearing the, the sound of them in those voices is really, um, is really important. I love it. That's why we record them. Um, Anne says, um, I think she was responding to, um, to Kathy's, um, Kathy Miller's talk about, um, she said, it made me think about the history of the poet and the poet's experience as much as the history evoked by the poem. And I think that's a great way of putting it. And um, yeah, when you think about what people have to go through to write these poems. Um, and Jane Hirschfield has a great poem about being grateful for a pen and paper and a quiet place. Um, it's a great, it's a great poem. And, and yeah, if, if we're lucky, if we have a quiet place and pen and paper. Um, let's see. Um, Anne was saying before that, that she really thought that footnotes would be a helpful thing for, for the, uh, in the tradition because yeah, he slings so much history at you. It's hard to catch up. Um, there's, uh, there is not a footnoted edition that I could find. Um, I just ended up Googling everything. So <laughs> if you didn't know to look for, he says something about satchel moments and he's talking about Satchel Page, the, page, the incredible, um, they think one of the, the world's best pitchers who never got, he played in the major leagues when he was 40 um, because he, wasn't al he was only allowed in the Negro Leagues before that. Um, but um, yeah, there's, a, there's another couple of great poems about Satchel Page uh, that if people are really fond of him, I can send over. Um, Anybody have any other, let's think um, the chain gang one. I didn't know a lot about the history of chain gangs until I read this poem and then went and researched it. Um, it was incredible. It was basically, you know, sometimes um, African-Americans would be fined for loitering and then they would be sent to jail and they would be put on 10 years of rock breaking duty. Um, and Unbelievable. Um, it was, it, it was, it like broke open a whole window into a history that I didn't know about. So that's one of the things I hope poetry can do is, and is, is make you curious, right? So um, next week we're talking about family, which makes me very happy because um, I'm lucky to have a family. So um, there's a, a bunch of terrific poets, including one of my favorites, Lucille Clifton. She writes a really fun, but also bittersweet poem about her family that we're gonna listen to next week. Thank you everybody for joining us today. What a, um, what a nice thing to have the, the, have friends around that want to learn about poetry. Thank you so Thanks. much. I really enjoyed this and oh, I'll look forward to Lucille Clifton. Always, always a favorite. Um, I did um, already in the chat post the link to uh, post the title of the book you referred to by uh, Carol Torche. Um, that that was just her memoir, which she talks about all of those yes. poems, correct? Yeah, so that's in there. And um, I'll send a follow up email to folks again with the links to our um, books in the library um, relevant to these poetry moments. 
And uh, just thank you all again for attending today. Have a great afternoon. Thank Bye. you, Therese. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it.